we can get started. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is the, I think, fourth session in the SRC's Radical Education Week series. Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge that um, this session is coming to you from stolen Indigenous land. Um, if you're in Australia in uh, at the moment, you're on stolen Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, if I'm currently on the land of the Darug people. If you want to put in the chat uh, whose land you're on, that's also great. Um, but I will start by introducing our panelists. Uh, Frank Stilwell is Emeritus Professor of Political Economy at the University of Sydney. Having taught in the department for 50 years, Frank was intimately involved in the founding of the department and has been a vociferous critic of orthodox economics for his academic career. Um, he's the author of 12 books, including most recently, The Political Economy of Inequality. Uh, Joe Collins is a lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney. Joe writes and teaches extensively on rent theory, landed property, extractive industry, and is a much beloved member of faculty. And Leah Perkins is a student in political economy and one of the current student representatives for the department. She's also the current vice president of the Political Economy Society and the SRC Welfare Officer. Uh, and I'll be moderating this discussion. I'm Swapnik, I'm the current SRC president, and I'm also a fourth year in political economy. Um, to begin with, I think we might, I might start by asking our panelists a little bit about the origins of political economy. Uh, Frank, you were very much involved in the founding of the department. Uh, do you want to give a little bit of history and context as to how and why this department was founded? I could give you a relatively short version. I guess I'm the person to do it since I was there at, at the Battle of Hastings uh, and uh, uh, saw blow by blow the whole evolution of a department that is still to this day, I mean, really outstanding in terms of uh, being the product of a struggle to establish an alternative economics education. All over the world, certainly then as now, students often grumble about economics. They find it pretty tedious, overly theoretical, lacking engagement with real world issues. Uh, but for the most part, they just sort of see their subjects out, maybe change, change their course enrollments to something that's a bit more interesting and, and relevant. Um, but back in the early 70s, when I just arrived in the uh, then Department of Economics as a lecturer, uh, there was already, I sensed, a, an, an unusual ferment among the students. There have been some changes to the economics curriculum that have made it even more mathematical, even more theoretical, even less um, relevant to uh, contemporary concerns. And remember, at that time, there were strong anti-war movement, the growth of feminist movement, environmentalist movement, co concern with the effects of imperialism on a world stage, economic studies seem to have no bearing, no connection to, to those broader social concerns. And the students were saying, well, it should have. We, we need to know how the economy has its these social uh, and environmental effects. And we need to be focused on how to make change so that we can address those problems. So a student movement developed. Um, it became increasingly radical. The more the professors in the department said no, uh, the, the students, together with some younger academics like me, designed a pluralist course that would allow them not, not just to study the mainstream economic ideas, but also to have a look at Marxist, feminist, environmentalist, and other dissident viewpoints. But predictably, of course, the conservative professors said no way. Uh, and uh, the, the student movement therefore developed from a movement for reform into a movement for separation. They said, well, if, if the current economics department won't allow these things to happen, we want a new department of political economy. Well, to cut a long story short, they didn't get it right away. Um, 
but the university authorities eventually conceded to allow an introductory first year and second year course to be introduced in political economy that students could take as an alternative to the mainstream e economics education that the professors still thought what, what, what was, the, was the, the, the right way to understand this subject. So we limped along for some years with a sort of a, this partial compromise where the students were able to do some political economy, but not complete a full major or honors in the subject. And predictably, of course, a, a further round of activism occurred so that people could have a more comprehensive education. So there were more petitions, more demonstrations, more protests, a sit-in in the vice chancellor's office, a two-week occupation of one wing of the economics faculty building by the students. And eventually uh, the, the, the authorities relented and uh, allowed a full program including uh, third year honours and eventually, much later, uh, postgraduate studies in political economy. And in the early 2000s, that's over 40 years had gone by, a department of political economy was introduced as part of a faculty restructuring because we moved into the faculty of arts and for that purpose, we had to become a separate department. So we're talking here about a struggle that was over 40 years in achieving its goals. Now, I'm happy a little later in the discussion to reflect on how it is that you maintain that kind of momentum. But in, in a nutshell, that is the story. And uh, it's, it's a, a success story. And it's always good when struggles are, are successful. Um, sometimes it's a great experience even when they're not. But uh, in this case, we established a program that over that period of time, about 20,000 students have taken. Some have gone on to positions of influence in Australian society, Premier of New South Wales, Deputy Premier of New South Wales, the leader of the Labour opposition currently in Canberra, but not just in the political sphere, but in, in many other walks of life too, uh, political economy graduates, uh, with a background in alternative and critical economics education uh, have uh, shown the success of the struggle. Yeah, well, that's a, I mean, it's a fantastic story about the, the foundation of political economy, but I am curious, Frank, um, how much of that sort of initial student and faculty foment was linked, I guess, to other movements for heterodox economics or radical thinking of, across the globe because you know around the same time at UMass Amherst in the US there was a, a similar department being established there was the sort of critical economics faculty at Cambridge there was sort of a movement towards a, a critical economics faculty at, at JNU in India how much of that had a bearing on on the students and, and faculty at Sydney well I think for many of the students, they didn't know about any of that. Uh, it, was, it was the local concerns that drove the local activism. Some of the academic staff, such as myself, did know of uh, comparable movements elsewhere, and we tried to learn something from their experience. But perhaps a turning point came in 1976. The uh, university authorities had relented and allowed us to hold uh, or, or mount a political economy course for the first time for first year students. And uh, we decided to have a major conference to try to make our movement nationwide in the first instance, not just Sydney Uni based, but nationwide. And for this purpose, we invited some international speakers. We invited some of those political economists from uh, Massachusetts in the United States, another from the UK and uh, it was quite an event about, uh, I think it was over a thousand people, maybe, maybe nearer 2000 people turned up to a conference on the Sydney campus. It was more like a rally than, than a conference. Uh, and it certainly helped to build those international links. And I have to say that in the intervening uh, half century, 
um, those links have got much stronger. Student organizations worldwide through rethinking economics, through the International Association for Pluralist Economics, these, these organizations have, have developed in a way that you can now get a real strong sense of a global movement in which Sydney was one of the, the key building blocks. Yeah. I'm interested to hear your perspective on all of this, Leo, because you know, a large part of this was student militancy driving it. And, you know, there were many quite prominent students at the time who've, you know, as Frank referenced, gone on to quite, you know, heights in, in contemporary society. But I'm interested to hear, you know, your reflections on, on the kind of student militancy that, that we're hearing about from Frank. Yeah, the photo of Anthony Albanese in the clock tower rings a bell as to what Frank is referring to. Um, I imagine if the Labour Party were doing that today. Um, yeah, I guess like in terms of studying um, political economy um, today, while sort of we're in, I guess, a university that, um, you know, is experiencing cuts in, in various places and like arts degrees or a degree of political economy just recently increased in, in price a lot, um, as many people would know. And I think that like uh, combining the, the militancy and the action um, that like we can we can learn from the past and also that um i guess students today are are pushing towards and um are getting involved in um i think shows a lot of hope for how we can um how we can use that struggle further yeah yeah well i think that's a a good segue for us to to start talking a little bit more about the contemporary dimensions of of political economy um this one's for, for all of the, the panelists, but I'll start with Joe. Joe, what is political economy to you today? What does it, what does political economy mean in this context? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Swapnik. Gee, that's a tough question. You could have prepped me for that one. Uh, <laughs> political economy, it's for me at this present moment is more important than ever because the, the reasons that uh, the, the, the department emerged in the first place, as Frank has just outlined, are not only still with us, so the demands for a, an alternative conception of economic theory and indeed its practice, uh, those demands are very much with us today, but I think in even more pressing and important circumstances, uh, we're facing certain challenges today that are not only uh, ripe for the type of political economy analysis that we teach through our curriculum. But I think the combination of study and struggle uh, in relation to some of the challenges that we face as a society, uh, not just at this very moment, but indeed the things that are coming down the line uh, in, in relation to broader challenges like the climate crisis in the context of dealing with the current pandemic response, uh, require something that the mainstream of economic uh, economics uh, teaching just doesn't offer. So uh, I suppose in response to your question of what is political economy today, for me, it, it, it transcends the disciplinary boundaries that we are familiar with in the social sciences. And I would go beyond the standard uh, approaches to theorizing economic problems. And I would say that political economy is the study of power and change in society to realize a stated ambition. Um, and it's, I think it's this normative element of political economy that is precisely the type of thing that Frank uh, and Frank's colleagues helped realize in the 1970s and something that we're still uh, attempting to realize today. Yeah, Frank, what is political economy to you today? Well, it's a means of understanding the society in which we live, uh, you know, and in particular, it's economic underpinnings, uh, economic underpinnings that uh, are reflected in corporate power, in state power, in uh, a, a capitalist system which uh, is based upon markets, but underlying and beyond those markets are tremendous concentrations of power which shape our lives in so many ways. So I think. Uh, 
if you see political economy in that way, it is a, a, a unified social science. We want to understand the society in which we live in its entirety. But we argue that the entry point for such inquiry is to look at the economic interests that are involved in shaping that society. Now, there's a lot more to society. There's, there's cultural relations, there's ecological characteristics. But if we make the economic elements the entry point, that really focuses sharply on the power relationships that, uh, that Joe has just mentioned. The power relationship between men and women, between capital and labor, between those with a vested interest in the status quo and those that, that are seeking change of various kinds. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Leah, what is political economy to you today? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I have anything more to add than um, the, the two uh, lecturers have, uh, but I would just add that um, I was thinking about what what Frank's saying about power um, and how it yeah, crosses over into our understanding of the world today. And I think that it becomes especially relevant when like, um, you know, you're writing, I wrote an essay for a class where I was sort of referencing coercive control, I guess, in like a, in a, a criminalization sense, but looking at these, these power dynamics and that sort of directly connected to conversations I was having in the women's collective on campus about um, the same issue. And I think it's political economy does help like inform these ideas and give us critical ways of, um, of talking about and thinking about um yeah the world yeah i mean to, to pick up on that point the power relations are certainly a fundamental part of political economy that you don't get in orthodox economics because you know in the orthodox economic model where everyone is receiving their just desserts in a perfectly competitive equilibrium solution and everybody is a, a rational utility maximizing uh individual agent there's no place in which power relations can come in. But I think that raises another interesting question that political economy is sort of tangential to. And I think Joe and Frank, you two might be able to reflect on this quite a lot. But the claim is often made, I think, from critics of political economy or from people from within the orthodoxy that the political economy is, you know, insufficiently rigorous or it's not analytical enough or it's it's too wide and it's it's focused what would you say to, to those kind of claims well it's it is a difficult question i mean if one's notion of rigor is a, a set of equations that has a single solution then uh political economy typically fails the test but if, if your test of rigor is the capacity to generate information that is useful in understanding and changing the world, then you've got to think much more broadly. So I think uh, you know, any subject that breaks down conventional boundaries and tries to build interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary links is not going to be rigorous by uh, mathematical uh, standards. Um, but it may just be what we need in order to understand the world out there, in, in the social world out there, because power relations, relationships between people individually, collectively, uh, are, are seldom reducible to equations. Uh, they're, they're malleable, they're contingent, they're dependent upon context. And, and this is the broader perspective, a, a geographical perspective, recognizing the specificities of particular places, a historical perspective, recognizing that what's possible at one point in time may not be possible at another. These are the elements that we have to weave into an integrated social science uh, and into political economy. So, so uh, I, I mean, to summarize my answer, Swapnik, I think we can't fight on the terrain of rigor for progress in political economy. We have to fight on the terrain of relevance. 
I see we've got a hand up from Sam. I might just go to Joe first and then come to you, Sam. Thanks, Swapnik. Um, I just, yeah, I just suppose I'd, I'd add to Frank's comment, um, and I agree. Uh, but I, what I would say is that the the task of the discipline needs to be adequate to the problems that we're facing, right? So. I think that's the test of any kind of um, intellectual uh, endeavor is that whether or not it's it's adequate to the task that it's set itself and the task that we've said is to engage with real world problems that are confronting us in the present moment um, and therefore we need to be able to uh, engage with other disciplines not just across the social sciences but indeed uh, the physical sciences and I might just add that it's the character of this engagement that I think is important because as we've seen, mainstream economics does attempt to engage with other disciplines, but on what basis is, is the question. Uh, and you know, is it, is it an imposition of a set of rigorous uh, concepts upon another discipline as we see in fields, emerging fields, such as um, you know, neuroeconomics, for example, that comes to mind and various other attempts from the mainstream to try and uh, insert itself into other disciplines? Or is it on the basis of a, a mutually deterministic uh, synthesis uh, where, where you get, I think, more useful uh, attempts to understand certain problems such as political ecology, uh, for example? So I, I would say two things. It's the test of political economy is whether or not it's adequate to the task of addressing these social issues. And secondly, it's the basis upon which we engage with other disciplines uh, that separates us from, from the mainstream. Yeah, Sam, you had your hand up. I'll come to you. Cool. Um, hopefully I'm able to articulate this well enough. I'm a baby ECOP student um, coming from science originally, though. Um, before, I think both Joe and Frank mentioned um, a normative element um, within their sort of ECOP school um, and then have now talked about how I guess one of the stated aims of the department is to solve real world problems. Would you say that there's a strong contrast in that many economists are trying to build models that are kind of like the natural sciences in that they're trying to model what the world looks like rather than saying what should the world be? Yeah, I'm happy for our panelists, if anyone MP wants to jump in and answer that. Yeah, I'll happily do that. It, the question touches on some uh, big issues, Sam. Uh, one, one of my early books was called Normative Economics, actually, and it teased away at that distinction that uh, economists tend to make between positive and normative economics, positive being about what is and normative being about what ought to be. Um, it, it sounds like a pretty neat distinction and it has some philosophical foundation, um, but in practice, the lines tend to be blurred because even our selection of what we study about the existing world often reflects our judgments about what is important and therefore what ought to be. Um, so although the, the, the distinction between positive and normative is neat, in practice, the lines tend to be rather blurred. But certainly, I think my second point is that the political economists do want to push to the normative elements. The, they're critical of the so-called positive economics of the mainstream because it's very selective in what it actually focuses on. It focuses on some abstract notions of competitive markets, the, those self-interested behaviors that Swapnik referred to, uh, and uh, the equilibrium states towards which allegedly the, the current economic system tends. Well, political economists say, hmm, funny, equilibrium states, uh, global financial crash, uh, growing inequalities, ecological disaster, climate change, uh, uh, now COVID. Hey, wh wh where's the equilibrium state here? Um, I used to, uh, is your notion of what is actually misleading. Uh, should we perhaps start thinking about uh, 
studying the world in terms of processes of change from what is to what ought to be, because that's where the action is. That's where the political element in political economy comes in, of course, is how we study not just what currently is, but how we study possibilities of transition to better situations for the future. Thank you. Just to um, add to that before I, I see that Joe's unmuted, I think there is, it's a good sort of jumping off point for a broader discussion about sort of the normative content of political economy. But I think there is a sort of unstated normative aspect to the, the dominant strain in economic thought. You know, the first fundamental welfare theorem of economics and the neoclassical thing is that, you know, perfectly competitive markets produce a Pareto efficient equilibrium or whatever. Then you look at the world and say, well, that doesn't exist. But the conclusion that often tends to be drawn from that, the, the fact that those perfectly competitive markets don't exist is how can we then get the second best solution, assuming that those perfectly competitive markets are the best. And that's, I think, the underlying logic of a lot of sort of mainstream policy conclusions, which is we ought to deregulate things because it brings us closer to this, this idealized vision of, of markets. I think that's fallen away somewhat in the mainstream in recent years with the more empirical turn that's, that's happened in the, since the 2000s. But certainly if you go back a little bit further and still in you know, the top journals in economics and whatnot, that's definitely the way in which they approach problems. And even I think the normative content um, of things like utility maximizing behavior as being, being described as rational, you know, itself imputes that behavior that is not utility maximizing or self-interested is irrational in some way. And um, I think those understated normative um, concerns still sort of resonate through the discipline, even if they're not recognized by the practitioners themselves. Uh, Joe, and then I see Bill has a question which we can take as well. Thanks, Swapnik. Uh, look, I, I really just wanted to uh, add a couple of comments to what Frank was saying, which I, I agree with, uh, and that is that I think it's a false dichotomy. This this notion that there is a, a sort of a, a you know a value free line of inquiry, and then one that entails a normative dimension, because the formation of the concepts that allow you to ask the question of what is. Um, necessarily presuppose a vision of what ought to be. Um, and all you have to do is read some of the foundational texts, um, like Alfred Marshall's Principles of Economics, for example, you know, just go through the, the preface and the, the introduction to see that there is a very clear vision of what the world ought to be embedded in the articulation of a, a, a foundational method for telling us what is. Um, and I think, you know, in some regards, you could say that political economy is just a bit more honest about that. Um, it's not as if everybody in the department agrees uh, about what that normative vision for the economy uh, is. And it's the, the substance of those debates around what should be uh, the stated aim, I think, are some of the, the, the most productive aspects of the discipline. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. I don't want to take up too much time on this question. No, um, thanks for those answers. Uh, we've got another question from Bill in uh, the chat, but before we move to that, I, I want to ask a little bit of a sort of separate question to Leah, which is to say, you know, why why have you been interested in political economy? Because I suspect it links to the kind of discussions that, that we're having now about this you know, stated normative content and the idea of pushing for a, a, a better world in, a, in an economic framework. But I'm interested to hear what your sort of specific experience of it has been. Yeah, I mean, um, I started university and in my first year took an elective, like ECOP 1001 as an elective, and I was majoring in um, politics and history. And um, 
kind of pretty quickly sort of felt like the the first year political economy course I was doing was um, a lot more interesting than intro to IR and just talking about liberalism in sort of a broad sense and then talking about you know rationalism in another like broad sense um, and I couldn't yeah I guess the from there I had found the interest in like what other things I was getting involved in at uni and the way that um, it sort of made connections to like ideas about yeah what the what the world could look like or um, I guess questions about um, should we really be thinking with this framework or should we be you know considering different approaches and I think that's what I found most interesting um, then and yeah that I guess that's what prompted me to to switch majors and also continue continue study. Yeah I mean uh, that's certainly I think true of political economy in a way that it isn't of other disciplines which is that it is very self-reflexive it is very, it looks into itself a lot. Yeah, I guess the, the the critical of itself as well as critical of everyone else sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the, the, the classic conservative line is that, you know, you come to university and then everyone's trying to turn you into a Marxist. But I don't think that's true in political economy. I think that it gives you a, a wide ranging set of tools from which you can, you know, be just as critical of, of Marx and Marxism as you could have other things and uh, I suspect that that's not really true of other disciplines um, you know having also studied IR myself prior. Um, Tiger. Yeah I just I wanted to jump in here and say that I've had a reasonably similar experience to Leah and I think that one of the most interesting things that drew me to ECOP after just doing it as an elective is the pluralist approach doesn't just like teach teach good thinkers like it's it, ecop doesn't just bring good thinkers into the world it brings good learners i think and it, it's kind of acceptance and approach um, of critical thinking and um, examining every kind of idea that's brought up on its own merit like to be honest the, the marxist lectures are my favorite part of the course and that's the most interesting part of the content but i think the course would be worse off if it was just marxist political economy i think yeah the pluralist approach and the like the attention to critical thinking is is the best part of the course for me. Frank. Really interesting questions about pedagogy. I mean, much is made of the notion of going to university to learn uh, critical thinking, you know, how to engage critically with, with propositions of various kinds. I mean, philosophy is, is a wholly in a sense, dedicated to, to that line of inquiry. And in a way, political economy is a branch of philosophy because we're, we're constantly trying to challenge what is, think about alternative ways of uh, understanding, changing the world in which we live. Uh, and I see political economy as always having had those two focal points. One is the critique of economic theory the existing corpus of accepted knowledge which needs to be challenged and, and a pluralist education in political economy is much the best way of doing that but then of course there's the second challenge of actually changing the world out there the critique of capitalism or of other forms of social organization that don't produce fair progressive and sustainable outcomes so we've got to somehow balance our concerns between what you might call a scholarly critique about uh, academic disciplines. And on the other hand, a critique of the real world and uh, trying to mobilize our energies into changing it. Now, for both purposes, I, I always think in terms of a little quartet, critique being the starting point for both journeys. Second step, is uh, developing a vision. What are you trying to achieve? What, what's the alternative to which, which we aspire, uh, both in our understandings and in the world in which we live? But then thirdly, there's the matter of strategy. How do we get from here to there, from the unacceptable present to the desired future? And then fourthly, the organization through which we make that uh, journey. Uh, 
Um, and actually looking back on the history of the political economy struggle, it had all those elements. The critique of mainstream economic education, a vision of a progressive pluralist alternative education, a strategy of trying to challenge the authorities through demonstrations, as well as logical arguments, uh, in order to achieve a, a separate department where this kind of alternative education can flourish, an organization increasingly international in character, um, whereby student movement can link up with progressive academics to try to extend these, these processes of change globally. So, in a way, the, the, the political economy movement is quite a nice little case study of that critique plus vision plus strategy plus organization model of social change. Now, all we've got to do is to apply that to the world out there. Yeah, um, I saw someone just had a hand up and has gone down. If, if you wanted to speak, um, go for it. But otherwise, I might ask Leah and Joe if they had sort of further reflections on, on, on this side of things. Um, yeah, I can, I can go. Um, I really liked that um, case study sort of example that, that Frank just gave us. And I think it kind of goes into the, the question that Bill asked in the, in the chat. I don't know if you want to move to that, but um, just thinking about, um, yeah, what, like is the vision that um, we are, tr or we, we or anyone is like, I guess, trying to put forward and the the strategic approach of policy, of um, campaigning for things, of the, the various different um, occupations that students may have done over the years. Um, and yeah, how can that like approach be pragmatic and successful, like, succeed in its um, goals for change? Yeah. That is a great chance to move to Bill's questions. But before that, Joe. Thanks. Um, so I'm glad Bill asked that question. So for those who don't know, and I think Bill's had to leave now, but Bill Collios is a current PhD candidate in the department. I'm Bill's uh, primary supervisor. And last year, Bill, uh, who had done the post uh, the masters by coursework that we offer. Uh, got a job at the Commonwealth Grants Department. So Bill's currently in Canberra uh, working in the federal bureaucracy and putting into practice many of the things that, that Bill learned uh, through the master's program. So I think it's a bit of a cheeky question there from Bill because he knows, he knows the answer and he's, uh, he's living the answer on a daily basis. Um, but in terms of how, how that how that change is realized. So to, to return to Frank's point, those of you that have uh, uh, had units of study with me before will know that I end every semester with a slide uh, of a book cover. And the book cover is of a 1994 book by a guy named Michael Pusey, a sociologist. And the book's called uh, Economic Rationalism in Canberra, a nation, a nation building country changes its mind. And to, to cut a long story short, Pusey, uh, administers uh, a bunch of surveys to senior public servants who are working in economic policy and asks them all, what was, what's, what's the thing that, that really um, focused your mind in terms of how you dealt with economic policy advice throughout the course of your career? What's the most important elements in that? And all of them overwhelmingly responded that it was the things that they learned at university, right? So I, I, I use that as the last slide in every semester because I try to get students to think about the fact that everything we've just discussed throughout the course of the semester has a real consequence on not just what you do immediately after your studies but indeed for the rest of your life and I think if we look at the context of, of Pusey's study in terms of trying to understand the changes in Australian economic policy as a consequence of a generation of people who entered into the bureaucracy with a particular educational background. I think that's testament to, to the project that, that, that uh, Frank and others have started and that we're trying to carry on today. Yeah. You know, this, this reminds me of a, of a great quote from Nugget Coombs, you know, one of Australia's great public servants and I think a Reserve Bank governor at one time. And he, I've just found the quote and what he said is that, um, you know, now the intelligentsia identifies with the system. 
the people who own and operate the system, when they offer criticism, it is not criticism that the system is not doing its social job. It is that it is not efficient, is not allocating resources in the best way. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he has a very firm view that the Australian intelligentsia has in economic and social matters failed the Australian community by giving a picture of the way the economic system works, which is inhumane and inefficient. I guess, to what extent do you think that, um, I, sorry, to what extent do you think what what Naga Coombs said was, was true and, and where do you see political economy as sort of fitting into and, and responding to those concerns? Um, and that's to all the panel and anyone else that is that wants to pick up on it. In the uh, absence of anyone else doing so, I'm happy to do so, Swapnik. Uh, uh, Nugget Coombs is a great Australian, uh, one person who, in the mould of Joe, uh, as he just explained, uh, had a positive influence as a public servant in developing some of the most uh, significant Australian institutions after the end of the Second World War. But I, I don't quite understand this notion that, you know, understanding uh, the economy is, is so deficient uh, is particularly uh, what he was getting at, because the, the dominant way of economic uh, theorizing then as now emphasizes the strengths of a capitalist market economy and therefore sees uh, the state and the institutions that he himself was developing were as just sort of band-aids on, on, on the system or, or if, actually if you think the the system is fundamentally sound uh, you only really need some quite small band-aids to deal with minor imperfections and that i think is the dominant story you get out of mainstream economics whereas if you study political economy you start to see more systemic flaws you don't see uh, the tendency to environmental degradation for example as just the result of an externality that's uh, because of faulty market pricing uh, in relation to environmental goods you start to see a more systemic uh, origins of capitalist exploitation of nature, the extractivist model of production on which our uh, affluent society is based. Uh, you start to see, you know, really structural flaws that require much more than ancillary institutions, much more than band-aids. They really call us to rethink the whole underlying structures of the way in which the economy and society is organized. And I think climate change is, is the current issue that is so most fundamentally uh, throwing down that challenge, but so too more general problems of inequality, recurrent economic crisis, the lack of economic security require us to think beyond, I think, the, the realms that Nugget Coombs was pointing to, to uh, the area that's in where reform shades into revolution. It's a great response. Griffin's just given us a, a fantastic question um, in the chat, which is that, how do you find simplifying and communicating academic and non-lay person ideas for working class audience? See, this is a goal for university education to break bourgeois accessibility gaps. I wonder if, you've, if you have found it difficult to break down often technical concepts. Uh, Joe, I might throw that to you first. Thanks, Swapnik, and great question, Griffin. Uh, look, I think, I think it's not that difficult, really, if... Uh, if if you have a, a grasp of the technical content and most economic problems are in fact uh, very much intuitive to, to the majority of people and it's not too hard to find ways of uh, explicating those uh, more technical aspects of the economic problem. And I mean, I'm just trying to think of, of an example, one that's been borne out 
in the current situation. And let's talk about something that I know is uh, near and dear to Frank's heart, so the, the issue of inequality uh, and the ways in which in, uh, economic inequality manifests in the city of Sydney. Uh, it's not difficult to uh, distinguish between things like wealth inequality and income inequality, for example, on the basis of um, the, the, the basis of house prices uh, being totally inaccessible to many people on the basis of what they can expect to earn. Um, and it's, I mean, it's even easier to point to the fact that we've inherited certain spatial elements to the way in which Sydney is organised that have contributed to uh, not just the, the breakdown of the systems of provision for subsistence needs in the course of the pandemic, but indeed into how the, the pandemic uh, has been able to spread or, or the various ways in which it's been difficult to mitigate uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, because of the fact, for example, that all of the distribution centres for most of the logistical supply chains, not just in New South Wales and the country, are based in southwest Sydney and go up in a ring around the M7 to the north. So it's, it's not difficult to break down what appear or, or could be rendered in very technical language uh, to quite in, in quite accessible ways. It's a great response, Joe. Frank, did you have anything in that respect about sort of breaking down ideas into a into a more accessible way? Well, it has to be done. I mean, uh, in, in university, of course, in our processes of critical inquiry and pluralist education, you, you've got to have some degree of sophistication, of course, but in communication of the ideas, the product of those inquiries, that research in, in the broader world, it's got to be translated into forms that people find uh, digestible and uh, point to... Uh, things that can practically be done. Um, certainly if one's dealing with politicians, you know, you've got to have your, your one page executive summary of dot, dot points. Uh, you know, there's no point in uh, presenting a, a, a long treatise of, of logical argument. Um, so, and, and, but I, I always think myself, I'm a teacher first and foremost. Uh, well, I, I do research, but the challenge is always to get it massaged into a form where it seems to matter. Where, in other words, where, where people can understand what it's all about, what its significance and implications are. And uh, we should avoid jargon. We should keep things uh, clear, but that doesn't mean we have to dumb down. I think most uh, sophisticated ideas, certainly in the realm of political economy, can be translated into readily understandable forms. Among my other roles is as the coordinating editor of the Journal of Australian Political Economy. And I actually spend quite a lot of my time helping people to do just that. You know, they may have great ideas, but they don't express them very clearly. So I edit their work and try to suggest different ways in which the ideas might be better communicated. We all need to learn those skills. Uh, I'm not sure universities are great at nurturing them because we put a lot of emphasis on writing essays, writing theses. The, these are scholarly uh, contributions for the most part, uh, but for broader public social change, I think we need to put equal effort onto effective communication for a broader audience. Okay, we've got a great question from Jack after that, which is, um, he's wondering if the panel thinks there's any benefits in taking classes from the mainstream economics department while they're also doing their political economy studies. Oh, Anyone have a ready-made answer to that? While I'm talking, I'll happily answer that. The answer in brief is yes. Why not? Uh, there's no... Uh, the, e even if it, ultimately it might strengthen your critique, but it's always important to see things from the other person's point of view. If, if there's a contest of ideas, challenge number one is to find out what's behind those rival ideas. Are there any points of convergence? Where, where do the points of disagreement stem from? So study of mainstream ideas is a good idea. 
actually going to be challenging them, whether it's in a scholarly uh, context or, or in a broader political and social context. It's important to know what their ideas are all about. But uh, th their own principle of diminishing returns might set in fairly early on. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but certainly some exposure to mainstream economics as the mainstream economists themselves practice it and preach it is, I think, part of a good education in political economy. Yeah, and I might just add to that and say that there are people on the margins of the mainstream or even deeply in the mainstream that have interesting ideas and that, that they're worth reckoning with, you know, people that come to mind in, you know, the, the field of inequality of people like Amartya Sen or Tony Atkinson that are, you know, very much steeped in the, the sort of mainstream world, you know, Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize winning economist. But also, you know, engaging with critical and normative ideas, um, and I think a lot of sort of recent um, economic debate about things like the minimum wage have led in the U.S. have led to mainstream models of monopsonistic, you know, wage competition that I think illustrate certain dynamics of of the system, um, and I think being able to reckon with and understand some of those tools, as well as empirical tools that are that are used in the mainstream, like econometrics and, and statistics and things, um, seems like a good idea. And I regret having not done more of that over my four years. Um, we're sort of running up against the, the end of the allotted time. Did anyone else have any questions or uh, do any of the panelists have any more responses to Jack's question? I'll, if there are I'll, just, I'll just add that, um, yeah, I think it's important to have a, a good foundation in the object of critique. So absolutely, I think you should uh, dabble in what the mainstream has to offer and uh, use that as a foundation or a point of departure for the critique. Of course, cool. it would be nice if the mainstream economists themselves issued uh, parallel advice to their students to do some political economy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I saw a hand go up and then go down. Was that a question or just an accident? Uh, yeah, I, I was just gonna ask, um, what would the panelists say to someone considering doing political economy either in undergrad or um, postgrad? And just like as a final, I don't know, because <laughs> uh, I'm considering it. Um, and then I also wondered how much have the fees gone up, but I can always ask, um, Leah, that I can just measure that in the chat. I think that's a great question for us to, to end on. Um, Leah, what would you say to someone who's thinking about studying political economy? Well, I mean, I, could, I couldn't give you advice about whether to do undergrad or postgrad, as I am an undergrad student. But um, yeah, I think that uh, it's a, a very worthwhile um, field to study in, and I would, I would highly recommend it, yes. Sam, Sam said a good figure. So I guess considering that, but yes. Um, Frank and Joe, uh, what are the panelists' opinions on what the best ECOP units we can take are? Before you answer that, I will say they're all fantastic. Um, 1001 and 1003 you have to do and are both really great. Um, I've gone certainly down the sort of heterodox economics rabbit hole and less down the social theory rabbit hole. So I loved um, economic theories of modern capitalism, um, but social foundations of modern capitalism was also terrific. Uh, and I'm sure there's many more. I I just did political economy of money and finance, political economy of the environment, um, theories in political economy, uh, class they're all fantastic there's really an infinite selection to the point where most of my electives have also been political economy units um if can i just chip in one little point that uh, uh 
as an alternative to trying to squeeze some political economy units into an undergraduate degree that's primarily focused in other subjects, uh, doing a master's degree in political economy is a great idea, because that way you can take a suite of options covering the sort of fields you've just mentioned, Swapnik, uh, uh, and you'll be in a, a nice sort of multidisciplinary environment because people from all sorts of different backgrounds come to do the Masters of Political Economy at the University of Sydney. Well, that takes us to three o'clock. Um, so I, we might have to wrap it up there. Thank you all for coming. And thanks particularly to our panelists for your very well considered answers. And also to everyone who asked a question. I think it's really fantastic that we can have audience interaction despite all of the limitations of Zoom. Um, the, a recording of this session will be up on YouTube sometime in the in the next couple of days. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, well. <clears throat>